May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> so if you're on uh, Facebook, you might occasionally get these little things where people go, well in my case it's find out your Star Trek name or your Doctor Who name, and they'll go, your... The day of your, like if you're born on the, in my case, the 11th, this is your first name, and then your month gives you your surname, and you might end up with some sort of Star Trek villain's name, or something like that. Now, I don't normally respond to those for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, I know what my Star Trek villain name would be. No. Um, uh, but there is another reason why I don't. Sometimes, what that is, is it's people fishing for details. You see, because if you respond to it, what happens is you've given them your name, because it's on Facebook, and you've given them your date of birth. And that's the start of, or it, 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 it allows people to build up, as, in a sense, a profile, and you might get identity theft. Because what happens with identity theft isn't somebody targets you, and they go, I'm going to steal so-and-so's identity. They just get as much data as they can on as many people as they can, and they match it up. And then once they've got enough information, they can create a false picture of you. That's identity theft. It's not somebody wearing a mask and pretending to be you going into the bank. And the reason I tell you that is because quite often with Mary, Mary Magdalene, there's a lot of Marys in the Bible, it was the most common name for women at that time in that part of the world. So that's why it gets confusing. Quite often we, we have some difficulty, I think, learning from Mary, partially because her identity got stolen. <laughs> not, not, not using Facebook, obviously. But what happened is, um, during the Middle Ages and things like that, her, this Mary and a couple of other Marys kind of got smooshed together and there were all sorts of stories about her, and she had been um, working as a prostitute, and all sorts of things. And we just don't get a very clear picture of her, because we don't know who she is. But just like with identity theft, if you actually know a person, if you, if you get to know them, if you look at their character and their attributes, you start to see that they're not the kind of person who will go and spend thousands of dollars on a credit card on stuff you know, an investment in Taiwan or something like that. That's not a personal experience story, I just want to clarify. So let's get to know Mary. What do we know? Well, one, we, we know her name, probably. Um, we think she came from a region called Magdala. That's what Magdalene means. But it, or, it can also mean tall or strong. So, I quite like that, because I like this picture of a really strong, confident woman who is one of the first disciples of Christ and supports him in his ministry. And we know she did that, too. She's one of those who's listed as being a disciple of Christ. We often think of Jesus as only having 12 disciples, but no. He had a bunch of boys that followed him around the countryside, uh, but there were many disciples in, in other regions. And Mary Magdalene is one of those. We also know that she is the first person to report to the disciples an experience of the risen Christ. And so she often gets the title of the Apostle to the Apostles. And it's, it's, it's in all the Gospels that this is the case. Which must have been a bit of an ego blow to some of the boys who kind of thought they were a bit special. <laughs> Maybe that's a lesson too. So what I'm saying is it's worth learning from Mary. And I was reading this gospel and I was reminded of a story I've heard before. And uh, I'm told it's originally a Buddhist story. It's a story of uh, a woman. And it's a tragic story because it's a story of her child who dies. And, and she is in great grief. And, and so what she does is she goes to the local uh, elder 
of the village and she says, can you give me my child back? I just want her back. I want my daughter back. And the elder says, I can't. I can't do that. And so she goes to other, to other people in the village and she goes to, to a local shaman and she says, can you give me my daughter back? I just want my child back. I just want her back. I can't. I just can't. And eventually she goes to like the mayor, the mayor of their little village. She goes, can you, can you help me? And he says, I can't. But there's a story, and I don't, look, I don't know if it's a true story. I, I don't know if he's still alive. But there's a story that up on that mountain, there is a wise old man. And he, he if anyone can help you, he can help you. And so, so this woman, in her grief, she packs a bag, and she starts to climb the mountain. And it's a tall, cold, windy mountain, and at night she's shivering, hiding in a cleft in the rocks, and then she just keeps climbing. And she's driven, and she climbs, and she climbs. And eventually she comes across this rickety old cabin at the very high to the mountain, and she goes inside, and she says, Are you the man? Can you help me? And he says, Here's what I can do. Here's what I can do. And, and he gives her a seed. And, he's, she, and he says, what you need to do is you need to plant this seed in a pot when you get down. But, but, it has to be planted in soil from a home that has known only joy and no sadness. It has to be planted in the soil from a home that has known only life and no grief. And so she takes it, and it's precious, and she wraps it, and she puts it in her coat, and she climbs down the mountain. It's precious, and she holds it the whole way. And she gets down, and she, she gets a pot, and she, she can't use the soil from her own home because, because it is just soaked in the grief. So she goes to her, her next door neighbor and she says, do you have soil from a home that's no, no sadness? And her next door neighbor cries and she says, my father died in this house. I can't, I can't help you. And so she goes to the next neighbor and she says, can you help me? I need soil from a home that knows no grief. And she says, my oldest boy went off to war. And he came back, and he's broken. And she goes to the next house, and the next house, and the next. And no home in her village has known no grief. No home in her village has known no sadness or death. But in her journey, she starts to realize that in her grief, she's not alone. In her sadness, She's not isolated. And so she's able not to not be sad. Of course she's sad. But she's able to find people to be with her. She's able to create space to recognize their sadness and hers. She's able to start to heal. And Mary is grieving. She's at the tomb and she's weeping. She thinks, and, and so did the other disciples, by the way, that somebody's come and stolen the body of Jesus. They, they haven't yet figured it. When it says they believe, they believed Mary that the body was missing. That's what they believed. The first thing that they had doubt with was that somebody would steal a dead body. And she is in mourning. She's grieving. There are tears streaming down her face. And it's in that moment, it's in that extended moment, where she meets the risen Christ. And, she, and, and the first reaction is to hold on to him as much as possible. But no, says Jesus, in your sadness you need to go to those who are also sad. And tell them the good news, not the good news that... I never die. Tell them the good news that there is hope and life that will continue and continue eternally. 
So for me, that's the message, that's the biggest thing from Mary. Is that in our grief, in the experience of our pain and our suffering, we become messengers of grace and love. Not because we are alone, but because everybody knows some pain. And God is with us in that. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.